One of the best ways to get at the immateriality of speech is to go all the way back to Plato. Plato was interested in a form that was somehow available to the material world, but wasn't in the material world. Eric Havelock, in his book Preface to Plato, describes it as a Platonic discovery of the per se. Now, by a notion of the per se, what Havelock was talking about was uh, Plato's ability to look at a beautiful sculpture, and then to look at a beautiful painting, and then to look at a beautiful sunset, and to ask himself, what is the beautiful per se? That is, not what are all the different particular beautiful things, but what is that quality of beauty as it can be arrested out of all of the particular instantiations of it. Now, in Nietzsche's writing, we find a kind of Neoplatonism where Nietzsche writes about ideas as lies. When he says that ideas are lies, what Nietzsche is suggesting is that the human mind has the capacity to equate the unequal, and that's... That is what makes language possible. Language is a kind of dance. It's a poetic possibility. In fact, I mean, Nietzsche writes on the difference between the intuitive man and the rational man. This distinction is between the person who's able to play with the abstractions, who's able to break the categories apart and doesn't suffer a, ha a hardening of the categories, and the kind of rational person who carefully attends to the existing structures that are already there and huddles around them, seeks security, some repose, but maybe not the enlivening and redemption of the artist. Well, this is what Nietzsche suggests to us. Now, rather than go into the scholarly debate, I want to give some examples about that help to illustrate the problem of someone who would try to suggest that the words, as words, are somehow in the materiality. I think we want to admit that there is a necessary and sufficient condition to language, and materiality is one of it, right? It's necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? Uh, if it were that words were simply in the material, then it would be the case that every time you would change the font, you would have a different word. If someone would misspeak, rather than recognizing a misspoken word, what you would have would be a different word. The same could be said of a misspelling. No, none of that really makes any sense. Uh, take this example. Now, this is an example in English, and it may not apply to other languages, but I think languages that do make this distinction would find it that this is an interesting fact. If someone were to say, apples are my favorite fruit, right, now that would make sense. Now, someone says, apples is a word in English, that also makes sense. But now, when you say apples is a word in English, you go from the plural to the singular of the verb. Why do we say apples is a word? Surely millions of people have used the word apples, and yet it remains singular, right? Now, imagine here as a, as a different case, right? Imagine someone comes up to you, and they say, hey, don't eat any apples, there's a shortage. I think we would say, okay, let's not eat any apples. Okay, I understand that. If a person would say, shh, don't use the word apples, there's a shortage, well, that wouldn't make any sense at all, right? It's obvious that it doesn't make sense, and the reason that it doesn't make any sense is because the words aren't in the material world in the same way that objects are or the things around us are somehow in a space and time that words are not. Uh, say you're going to have a dinner. If you have a dinner and you wanted to tell your friend something, and your friend comes over, you can tell your friend that, and you can share that dinner. But if some people show up, say the three extra friends shows up, now you're going to have to divide the food by the number of people there, but the telling of the story is very different. I mean, that doesn't have to be divided by the number of people there. Now, it may impact how you say what to whom and all this sort of stuff, but the fact is that the words themselves aren't a materiality. In fact, they can be repeated again after the event, and you can't really control what is said. Now, if you want to get to the problem of materiality, I'm going to admit, there is, as already addressed, an issue of indexicality. We, we don't want to not deny that, right? Dead men tell no tales. Now, I think the, the last thing that I would want to say about this issue of materiality is to address the difference between speech and the spoken word and all of the subsequent communication media. Now, my good colleague and friend, uh, known scholar Frank Dance, 
uh, he once suggested that all media that are subsequent to the spoken word suffer from a hardware dependency. I think this is a really great insight, that there is a kind of non-ecological soundness to all of the other media than speech. Speech somehow has the capacity to allow the people who are talking to bring anything near. I mean, to the extent that they're articulate and can speak well, they're able to produce objects for the imagination that people can find around them and enjoyable, all with zero post-production cleanup costs. It's really quite amazing. Uh, to look at the amount of resources and energy and the amount of materials that are left in its wake, that's what's really fascinating. Okay, so I think those are hopefully enough things to help someone think about uh, how and why one would want to say that speech is not in the material world. The words that we speak are somehow environments that we find ourselves within.